Fanny Adams was born on April 30th, 1859. She was born in the area of Townhouse Lane, Alton, in Hampshire, England. By 1867, Fanny's family consisted of Harriet and George Adams, her parents, and her brothers and sisters, Ellen, George, Walter, Lizzie, and Lily. Alton was a very picturesque market town for the young children to be brought up in, with the first recorded market in Alton dating back to 1232. The town of Alton was renowned for its plentiful supply of hops, which led to many breweries opening in the town and made hop picking an integral part of its economy until the mid-20th century. To the northern end of Tanhouse Lane lies Flood Meadow and surrounding the River Way, which sometimes is flooded in the area in times of heavy rain, owing its name Flood Meadow. A large hop garden was located next to the meadow. The Adams family was well liked in the community, and it is believed that Fanny's grandparents lived next door and that nobody had trouble with the family. Next door to Fanny's grandparents lived Minnie Warner, Fanny's lifelong friend. She was the same age, and the girls were seen more like sisters than just best friends. Fanny was described as being a tall, pretty, and intelligent girl. She appeared older than her age of eight. She excelled in school and was described as intelligent by those who knew her. Overall, Fanny was mostly known in the small village for being a cheery, polite, and content girl who always had a smile on her face. On Saturday, the 24th of August, 1867, eight-year-old Fanny was playing happily outside the family home with Minnie and her five-year-old sister, Lizzie. Typically, Fanny and Minnie would play together outside or inside their homes and would return later in the day for their tea. This August 24th was just like any other Saturday. The sun was shining and the heat was sweeping through the little village of Alton. Late in the morning, the three girls went into the home of Fanny and asked Harriet, their mother, if they would be able to go play at Fled Meadow. That's the meadow surrounded by hops fields close to their home. As the weather was hot, Harriet saw the day as perfect opportunity to finish her washing and complete her household chores, and so, because of this, allowed the children to go. Many local children liked playing in the meadow, and of course, there had been no crime in Alton for many years. With this in mind, Harriet did not feel like her children were under any threat from going there. Close to Fanny's home, there was a small gate that led into the local hops field, this is where the children decided to go. They arrived at a lane named The Hollow, which ran into the nearby sh village of Shalden, and it was here that the girls encountered a man. A man dressed in a black frock coat, a light waistcoat, and trousers. Despite his respectable appearance, he had obviously been drinking. The young girls talked with him for a few moments. They recognized him from around church and around the town. They ate the blackberries that he picked off nearby bushes for them before returning to their play up and down the lane. The man stood back and observed them as they laughed and played together. With the stifling heat and the sun still beating down, it's no surprise that the young girls grew tired after about an hour and so decided they would head back home and play in one of their homes. As they walked back home in the direction where the man stood, he approached them once more. This time he asked Fanny if she would like to go for a walk with him down to Sheldon. Not wanting to be left alone, Lizzie and Minnie offered to go with them. It was at this request that the man then offered Lizzie and Minnie three half pence to go to the local shop and buy some sweets. He then offered Fanny a half pence to go on the walk with him. 
Not tempted by the idea, Fanny declined and continued to walk away from the man. It was at this moment that the man from church simply picked Fanny up and walked down the lane with her over his shoulder. Lizzie and Minnie watched in sheer horror as the man continued to walk down the lane before deciding they should run home and inform their parents. Filled with horror, the two girls made it to Minnie's home and informed her mother, Martha, of what they had just witnessed. However, busy with weekend chores and the knowledge that nothing ever happened in Alton, Martha dismissed the two children and sent them to Minnie's room to play. It can only be assumed that with this reaction, that the girls believed that they had overreacted, and no harm was coming to Fanny. They followed Martha's instructions and went off to play. It was not until about 5 p.m. that they made their way home for dinner. Mrs. Gardner a neighbor who also lived on Tanhouse Lane, noticed Fanny's absence and asked the girls her whereabouts. The children told her of what had occurred earlier in the day, and they told Mrs. Gardner that Fanny had been taken away by the man. Mrs. Gardner ran straight with the information to Fanny's mother, and the two set off to search. As the two women searched, they met with the well-dressed man after going only a short distance, near a gate separating the hop garden from Flood Meadow. Mrs. Gardner asked him what he had done with the child, but he assured her that he often gave money to the children for buying sweets. Mrs. Gardner replied, I have a great mind to give you in charge of the police. To which he told her she could do what she liked. When she asked his name, he refused. His air of respectability impressed the women, and when he told them that he was a clerk of the local solicitor, William Clement, they allowed him to leave. The women returned home to wait for Fanny, believing that perhaps she did go to buy sweets or was still out playing. But it was at around 7 p.m. Fanny was still not home. And so the two women began asking neighbors and villagers if they would help in the search for Fanny. The groups split, some searching the nearby lanes and others heading towards the hollows and more still towards the nearby hops field. It was by now laborer Thomas Gates had headed out for the evening to check on his hops plants. As he entered his field, he was horrified by the view in front of him. Upon two of his hop poles was a mutilated girl's head. He immediately ran into the village to inform everyone. A closer inspection of the head revealed that her eyes were missing, along with one of her ears. Her mouth had been sliced up to her ears at both sides, with only one little girl unaccounted for in the village of Alton. It was clear the head belonged to Fanny. So who was Frederick Baker, the man from church? The young solicitor's clerk. Baker was a 29-year-old solicitor's clerk and he had arrived in Alton only two months prior. However, Alton was a small community, and in the heart of the village was a local church where many residents would gather for prayers. The girls had seen Baker here, and so were not scared. They knew his face from around town, and that owed to his being looked upon as respectable. George Adams, Fanny's father, was playing cricket at the same time of the discovery of his daughter's head, and so 
Harriet, her mother, ran down the lanes to inform her husband, but the poor woman, in distress of what had just been become clear, passed out. Instead, a fellow neighbor ran to tell him. George broke down into sobs before anger finally filled him, and then he ran the short route home and loaded his shotgun ready to hunt down Baker. However, many neighbors rushed around him and managed to calm him, and the neighbors stayed with the family throughout the night. The next day, hundreds of villagers gathered to search the local fields around where Fanny's head had been found. So it's at this point I want to give you a warning for graphic descriptions. Seriously, what happened to this little girl is disturbing. Thomas Gates was who found the head of the child in the hop garden. It was lying exposed. He also found the trunk of the body about 16 yards from the head. And he noticed that the body was cut open and cleaned out. Charles White also corroborated the, that statement of Thomas Gates finding the body and stated that he also found a girl's hat in the hedge where the remains were lying. Harry Allen, a coachmaker, found a heart and an arm in a field adjoining the hop garden. They were under the hedge, covered with some hedge clippings. The same man also found the lungs. Thomas Swain, a shoemaker, he found the left foot in a clover field on the opposite side of the hollow. Joseph Waters, a police constable, found an eye near the bridge on the Alton side at the bottom of the river way. And police constable Masterman found the second eye in the same river. William Walker, a painter living in Alton, found the stone that was covered with blood, hair, and a small piece of flesh. Police joined the hundreds in hopes that a murder weapon and further evidence would be found that could be traced to an owner, but by the end of the day, the scene had been trampled and most evidence lost. As Fanny's body was being sewn together at the leathern bottle just yards from her family's home, police superintendent William Cheney arrived from the local police station and headed to Flood Meadows to investigate the scene. Once he arrived, he was met by several people from Alton who led him to the leathern bottle and on the way, the villagers told him the story of how Baker had lifted Fanny over his shoulder and walked away with her. He informed all officers to begin a search for Baker's residence and the place of employment. At about a little after 9 p.m., Cheney and his officers arrived at Baker's place of employment, and due to the time, they had not believed Baker would still be there and yet were surprised when they opened the door and found Baker working at his desk. Cheney then informed Baker that he had heard of what had happened at the hollow and that Baker was now a suspect. To this, Baker began protesting his innocence. With only the knowledge that Lizzie and Minnie had witnessed the kidnapping and that nobody else had been labeled as a suspect, the decision to arrest Baker for the murder and mutilation of Fanny Adams was made. And as Cheney looked out into the street in front of the solicitor's office, he became aware that there was an angry mob outside and instead decided to usher Baker out the back door. 
When Baker was searched at the police station, he was found to be in possession of two unstained small knives. Spots were observed on both wristbands of his shirt and, and his trousers had been soaked to conceal blood stains. After being questioned about his appearance, Baker responded, Well, I don't see a scratch or cut on my hands to account for the blood. Baker's conduct during his interrogation was described as cool and collected. After the arrest, Cheney backtracked to Baker's desk in the solicitor's office, and there he discovered a diary among some legal papers. An entry had been made for Saturday the 24th, 1867, which recorded, Killed a girl. It was fine and hot. It was reported that the hop garden had been cleared by September 21st, but nothing connected with the murder had been found. It was also added that Baker remained completely unfazed with the murder and did not exhibit symptoms of insanity or remorse. He was remanded to Winchester Prison to await a formal committee hearing. The investigation. Investigations continued by the Hampshire Constabulary all the way into October. It was early in the month when a key witness came forward with new information. A young boy living close to Fanny's home informed the police that on the 24th of August he had seen Baker emerge from the hop garden at around 2 p.m. Baker's hands were reportedly covered in blood, as was his clothes. The boy then recalled that Baker stooped down into the river and calmly wiped himself with a handkerchief before placing what looked like a knife back into his pocket. The boy had told his mother almost immediately after witnessing the scene, but she had brushed it off believing it was a joke. She hadn't talked about it for two months until finally she did. Superintendent Cheney requested a forensic test in late October. All recovered clothing and the two knives taken from Baker were sent to a Professor Taylor at Guy's Hospital in London where they received the most detailed possible tests at the time. After examining them over the coming weeks, Taylor was able to confirm that the blood on the knives was from a human. One of the small knives contained a small amount of coagulated blood, although none on the handle. Taylor stated he would have expected more blood on the knives and signs of rust if they had been washed. The quantity of blood found was surprisingly small. However, Taylor did say that an inexperienced person armed with a proper weapon could dismember a body in about half an hour blood would still run, but it would not have spurted from the body. Further examination of Baker's clothes did uncover some small traces of diluted blood in some parts of his waistcoat, trousers, and stockings. Even the wristbands of his shirt had been folded back and diluted blood stains were found in the folds. Another doctor, Dr. Lewis Leslie from Alton, thought that the ultimate cause of Fanny's death was probably a blow to the head with the stone. Leslie speculated that a larger instrument had to have been used to cut the body and also added that the dismemberment was achieved in less than an hour. Forensics indicated that the cuts had been made when the body was still warm and that Fanny had not only been cut but also hacked and torn to pieces. The time that it had taken Baker to cut the body into so many pieces most likely gave him the opportunity to choose his positioning so that he might not necessarily be covered in blood. The forensic staff in London concluded that the small knives found in Baker's possession would not have been capable of severing Fanny's body, so another weapon had to have been used.
They also stated that there was no sign of rape on the body. The trial. The trial of Baker began on the 5th of December. The defense argued that Minnie's identification of Baker should be struck from evidence. They also argued that the knives were too small for the crime anyway, agreeing with the doctors. They surprisingly also argued that Baker was insane. Baker's father had been violent. A cousin had been in an asylum and his sister had died of a brain fever and that he himself had attempted suicide after a love affair. Further evidence, along with Minnie and Lizzie's witness statements, included the diary that had been found in Baker's desk. Remember the words. Killed a girl. It was fine and hot. The defense are argued that the diary entry was typical of a formal way of entry that the defendant had used, and that the absence of a comma after the word killed did not render a confession. After all this evidence was given, the judge decided that the jury could consider a verdict of not responsible by reason of insanity. The trial lasted about two days. The jury deliberated for 15 minutes, and when they returned, they returned with a guilty verdict. On the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, Frederick Baker was hanged outside Winchester Goal. The crime had become notorious and a crowd of more than 5,000 attended the execution. This was the last public execution held at the goal. Before his death, Baker wrote to the Adamses, expressing his sorrow for what he had done, quote, in an unguarded hour, and he seeked their forgiveness. Determined not to forget Fanny, the local community of Alton raised the money for a headstone which still stands in the cemetery where the unfortunate little girl is buried. This is where poor Fanny's story should have ended, except for a strange turn of events which would see Fanny's name become synonymous with anything worthless. The term Sweet F.A. or Sweet Fanny Adams. The expression was coined in 1869 by sailors in the Royal Navy. It was in this year that tins of mutton were introduced to the Royal Navy food rations, and when sailors opened the tins, one exclaimed that the contents looked like the butchered remains of Fanny. From this, the saying, Sweet Fanny Adams evolved, with the tins becoming known as Fanny's. Thank you all for listening and joining me. I wanted to give just a couple extra notes on my research. There are a few photos associated with this case from many people people reusing myself included but um, this photo is not Fanny it's not believed to be her photos were expensive and rare back then and Fanny's out Fanny's family were not of the kind to have afforded it they couldn't even afford a headstone so the photo of the grave is by some people believed to be Minnie and Lizzie standing at her graveside but when a family can't afford a headstone 
it's believed that when the funds were there, it took until 1874 to actually erect the headstone. And so Minnie and Lizzie would have been in their teens at that point. And some believe that this photo is actually of Taurus, say, lack of a better word, Taurus, that are standing beside it. Maybe a gruesome reminder of being aware of strangers or don't take money from strangers. Thank you so, so much for watching. And until next time, be safe.